Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody dies, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer today, didn't you? You tried to How do the dead come back from the What's the secret of the dead come back? Wicked Hill was a big round lump with a hollow top. The lower slopes grew bracken and bramble, but near the top nothing grew except short bladed grass. The stump of an old gibbet stood at one end of it. An earthwork with two gates ringed the top of the hill. On the top of this earthwork the magic circle was burning in a narrow line of blue fire, which was being fed by little black cats who walked around the ring dropping herbs on it. That used to be my job when I did this kind of thing, Nibbins whispered. The bonfire, which had now sunk to a glow, was in the midst of the circle. The people who had danced about it were now drawn together in a group. They were listening to a wizard in a long scarlet gown who seemed to be their king or chief. That's Abner Brown, Nibbins whispered. He's always the head of these big parties. Hush, said Kay. Let's hear what he's saying. So, my brothers and sisters, Abner was saying, we have had our evening's frolic. Now let us come to the evening's business. The great task before us is to find the Harker treasure. Here there were cries of, Hear, hear! We all know what it was. It was the treasure of the great South American Cathedral of Santa Barbara. It was a barge load of gold, silver, and precious stones, wrought and unwrought, but worth, as so the records prove, at least one million seven hundred thousand pounds. There are seven times seven of us. If we find it, the share of each one of us will be some thirty-five thousand pounds. I ask you, is it worth trying to find? There were loud cries of, Yes! You say yes, and you may mean yes, but will you all work for yes? There were shouts of, Yes! To the death! Very well, then, he said. I am glad we are all resolved. We will now break up our party, let the sevens leave the hill, except the Pouncer Seven. When most of the party had gone, Kay saw that Mrs. Pouncer, Sister Nightshade, and the rest of the seven drew near to Abner. Sister Pouncer, Abner said, why are you vexed? Enemies are at work, she said. They took my broom and Nightshade's broom, so that we have had to walk. Do not be vexed, my Pouncer, Abner said because I am far from vexed. I have discovered something very important about the treasure. Oh? What, dear Abner? You are quite wrong about it. It is not in the Harker home, but somewhere near here. At this there came cries of, No, it cannot be. How can it be? Where do you suppose it is? Why is it not in the Harker house? Where is it? We will find out that presently, he said, of where it is. Listen to what I have to say of whereabouts it is. The seven drew nearer, intently listening. You know, Abner went on, that when I was little I helped my father and grandfather, both of them Abner Browns like myself, to look for the treasure. I might say I was at this quest from birth. Here there were remarks of, here, here. As you know, my grandfather once had the treasure, but lost it. For more than twenty years he and my father dug for it where they thought it would be. One of my earliest recollections is of helping them to dig for it in a hot country of very red mud. Then my grandpop disappeared, and within a week my pop died of the yellow fever. I had a harsh word to wrestle with before I could take up the quest. When I took it up, just thirty years after those two laid it low, it wasn't easy to pick up the threads at that place in the red mud. The yellow fever had killed most everyone who had lived there when my pop and grandpop dug there. But I met an old negro who just knew where my grandpop gave up digging and disappeared. He gave up digging because someone found a treasure and carried it off to sea. He disappeared so as to settle matters with that finder. The finder was an Englishman named Benito Trigger. That is not much to go upon, is it? 
35 years ago, an Englishman gets to sea with the stuff 3,000 miles away and disappears. My grandpa goes after him and disappears. At first I thought that this Benito Trigger might be Captain Harker himself, for as we know, he lived for many years in quest of the treasure. Or pretended to, so as to lull suspicion while he lived on it, Mrs. Panzer said under her breath. But it was not Captain Harker, Abner continued, for when I came here to make inquiries I found that Captain Harker was at that time upon his deathbed. I need not tell you how interesting it was just to see the very house in which old Captain Harker lived, and to see his tomb, and to stand within just a few feet of those bones which, when they were alive, had started all this treasure hunt. For the moment I ruled him out. You didn't get the treasure, brother, I said. You were in your tomb before it could have reached England, if it ever did reach England. It was in his secret den before he ever sickened, Mrs. Pouncer muttered. Of course he had it. Had it all the time. But, Abner continued, I fell right plumb in love with this green countryside so full of real old buildings, so I just didn't rest till I'd taken Russell's Dean, that Queen Anne mansion in the Oakwood, where tradition says the Druids once practiced their rites. There, as you know, we have been able to establish our magic circle for the quest of the treasure upon the lines of the ancient knowledge. And there are red birds that come out of the wilderness with knowledge. One of them came to me this spring, just after I was settled in Russell's Dean. He led me to visit a certain church not many miles from here. And what did I find there? Here, some of the seven said, uh, the treasure, uh, some of the candlesticks, the church vessels in use again. No, none of those things, he answered. I found the tomb of my long-lost grandpop, Abner Brown. He had been drowned in the great flood here in February 1850. February Fildike, as you called it. Was not that wonderful. I have now raked out something of his end. He was last seen alive at the Condicut Inn, the Ring of Bells, on the last night of January 1850. He was then heard quarreling. With whom? With Sir Piney Trigger, a rich Honduras merchant who had just returned from two years' absence in the West. That Piney Trigger was the Trigger who had found the treasure and carried it off the sea. My grandpop had run him down. That night, after their quarrel, both my grandpop and Sir Piney disappeared. What happened, do you suppose? Many asked that at the time. I answer it. I say that Sir Piney had the treasure here, that my grandpop had discovered so much and asked for a share. They quarreled. I say that Sir Piney flung my grandpop into the flood and then fled the country, left the country, left the treasure, and never dared come back for it because of blood guilted us. The case is reported in the Condicut Remembrancer for February 1850. They knew nothing of any treasure, of course, only inquired into the disappearance. The coroner's jury supposed him to have been washed out to sea by the Great Flood. Now, Sir Piney was a well-known sportsman, mixed up in many shady matters. His daughter is still alive. I have seen her. There's no getting anything out of her. What I have tried to find out is, what brought him to Condicut that night? In the coroner's notes I found this, that it was supposed that he had come to look after a big barge of his which had come up the river some days before. It was a seagoing barge, fitted like a yacht. He had been in her in the west. I say that he brought the treasure in her. He hid it somewhere, not far from Condicut, and had come to see it or to remove it when my grandpop interfered. Here, as Abner paused as though for applause, Sister Nightshade asked, M May he not have taken all the treasure away in the barge when he took himself away? No, 
Abner said, because the barge, dead empty, had been washed ashore and stove in in the floods two days before he disappeared. No, my sweet seven, depend upon it. The treasure is near here, and somewhere here, probably near the river, we will find it. Here there was a sensation among the company. All were very much impressed and excited. Sister Pouncer said, Was there ever such a mind as our Abner's, like crystal from the spring? But after saying this, she moved nearer to Kay and muttered, This is all pure surmise. You have a bee in your bonnet, my good sir. I too have my views of where the treasure is, and we shall see who is right. Magic is a surer guide than a grand pop, or a little pop, for all your tingo and tango. Sister Pouncer holds a silken clue. And now, my dear Seven, Abner continued, we will have one short dance more, and then away, for the stars are dim and the cocks are stirring on their perches. Join hands and dance. A strange music began from somewhere in the air. The witches and wizards at once swept into a dance. Nibbins was very uneasy. I can't keep out of a dance like this, he said. Oh, it goes right through my marrow. And then, in a minute, they will all join hands and swing round and round till they see all sorts of things. You come away, Kay said, pulling him down the hill. You always were one for getting into scrapes. Let's go back home before they all come hurrying for their horses. If Mrs. Pouncer catches us at the spindle trees, we shall be in a mess. He made Nibbins run, keeping one hand on the scruff of his neck all the way, lest the sound of the dance should prove too exciting. In a few minutes they were high in the air again upon their horses, sailing far from the hill. It's just as well we started when we did, Nibbins said, for there's the dawn beginning. Sure enough, the sky behind them was showing colour. The two horses began to droop down towards the ground. Presently they were dragging along the ground, and at last they collapsed. We left it too late, Nibbin said. However, we're almost home. Come along, the gate's locked, but we can get over the wall by the ivy. They left the horses in the road, scrambled up the ivy over the wall, and then along behind the Loristinus till they were near the house. This is the place, Nibbin said. They were within thirty yards of the house in a thick shrubbery, but Nibbins must have touched a spring, for the ground gave way beneath them, and down they went into a secret passage. In another minute Nibbins was gone, and Kay was in his own room. What a night I've had, he thought. His slippers were muddy from the soil in the garden. I shall catch it, he thought. The cuckoo clock struck five. The room was quite light. He popped into bed at once. He didn't stay long awake, you may be sure. Just before he fell asleep, however, he heard a curious noise on the wall of the house not far away as though the jasmine had broken away and was scraping as the wind blew it. Uh, I suppose it's the jasmine, he muttered drowsily, but it may be Ellen up already, sweeping the stairs. When he came downstairs to breakfast, the governess was not down. She entered just as he was at the sideboard, helping himself to pork pie. She looked a little cross, as though she had not slept very well. You know, she said, that you're never allowed to help yourself to pork pie. It's very bilious, rich food, and then you won't be able to do your French. You must have an egg, like any other boy. And you don't mean to say, Kay, that after all the many times that I've spoken to you, that you've been in the garden again in your slippers, and on the beds too, and then you wonder if you catch your death of cold. Uh, but I haven't caught a cold, he said. Don't answer me back, sir, she said. You're a very naughty, disobedient little boy, and I have a very good mind not to let you have an egg. I wouldn't let you have an egg, only I had to stop your supper last night. Take off one of those slippers and let me feel it. Come here. Kay went up rather gingerly, having been caught in this way more than once. He took off one slipper and tendered it for inspection. Just as I thought, she said. The damp has come right through the lining, and that's the way your stockings get worn out. In a very pouncing way, she spanked at his knuckles with the slipper. He had expected a blow of the sword and by drawing his hands swiftly aside, the slipper struck the spoons on the table and made them dance. Now, you naughty boy, put that slipper on, and you'll learn the whole of your pouvoir before you go out this morning. 
What were you muttering under your breath, Kay? Um, I, I was just wondering if this was a duck egg or a, a hen egg. Use the subjunctive and the genitive, she said. Were a duck's egg, not was a duck egg. And it's a hen's egg. Duck's eggs are a great deal too rich. At any other time, Kay would have boasted that it was a double yoker, but refrained, thinking that this would probably lead to confiscation as too much for a young stomach. He ate his egg, but his mind was intent on many other things. Ellen came in. If you please, ma'am, Ellen said, would you mind speaking to Jane? Jane was at the door behind her. If you please, ma'am, Jane said, would you please look at this? This was the dish on which the cold goose had lain. But alas, now nothing remained but a few picked bones and a skeleton, almost bare. The cats have been in again, ma'am. I don't know how they get in. And the chine's gone the same way. And there's two more brooms gone. Did you lock the larder door, Jane? Yes, ma'am, and I took the key and I had it on my pillow. And if it isn't cats, and I don't know how the cats get in, then somebody must have a key and come in in the night, and I don't like it. I'll look into this after breakfast, Jane, the governor said, and I'll speak to Wiggins. Kay stared at the bones of the goose. He knew how that goose and chine had disappeared. Almost immediately Jane reappeared. If you please, ma'am, Wiggins has found the two brooms, the besom and the broom broom. They were in the road outside near the spring. Well, how on earth could they have got there? The governor said. I don't know how they got there, Jane said, but I don't like it. The governess did not talk during breakfast, but seemed to be considering this question of the brooms and the goose. Kay's thoughts were far away with Nibbins, Mr. Bytum, and that gathering of witches on the hill. Of all the dreamy boys, the governor said suddenly, going off into daydreams, it's my belief you need a dose. It's my belief you eat too much. You'll put your boots on before you come to lessons and ask Ellen to dry those shoes in the oven. Please, can't I wear my slippers during lessons? No, you won't wear your slippers during lessons. For one thing, they're not dry and you'll catch your death wearing them. And for another, you fidget me distracted by rubbing one slipper off and then the other just as though you were playing a game with them. This was a cruel thrust, because Kay did play games with them. When he had scraped off a slipper, he could push it about with his toes and imagine that it was a canoe full of redskins on the warpath going down the rapids, or a diving bell at Tobermory bringing up treasure from one of the ships of the Armada, or great-grandpapa Harker's ship, the Plunderer, engaging seven French privateers, or that famous horse lottery at various stages of the steeplechase, the prints of which hung in the study. But the boots were laced up things that gave no solace. There they were, and there you were. The governess stalked out of the room to investigate the larder door. Ellen came in to clear away. Kay looked up at the portrait of great grandmama Siskin. Her eyes seemed all right. This is the loveliest time that I have ever had, Kay thought and anything might happen. He walked slowly round the room, tapping the panelling. What are you doing, Master Kay? Ellen asked. I was just seeing if there are any secret passages, he said. Oh, there's no secret passages in here, Master Kay. What should there be secret passages for? Oh, Kay said, when people were doing murders, they always used to have them, and then smugglers had them. The smugglers were never here, Ellen said, not in this house. Down by the river the smugglers were, so my father said. They had the mill at seven hatches. Oh, and by the drowned man's copse way, they'd a place, and at the springs another. But they never could a come here. Your great-grandfather would never have allowed them. No, Kay said, but he would never have known. They could have crept in at night and made the passages. I don't think they could, Master Kay. Not in stone walls.